Hey guys, Whitney here. Welcome. We are going to give it just a couple minutes for everybody to file in the room here. Let's see. I wish I got to see everybody's names ahead of time, but I do. Yeah, All right. Be nice, right? I know, right? Like, how many people are in the waiting room? Uh -huh. Awesome. Guys, while you're filing in, um, just to get, you know, just some housekeeping here. Uh, make sure we have an amazing guest today. We are going to go over a topic that I know is going to like blow the doors off of some of your, your investing portfolios. However, I got to make sure that I keep the content kind of tailored down for those people who have never heard of a deferred sales trust before. Um, anyways, so with that, make sure that you have found your Q&A box or your chat box. That way I can help curate the conversation and the questions for Brett. Um, uh, we will answer the questions as we can and during the conversation. If not, um, I will hang out for a little bit at the end and clean up as much as I possibly can. But with that, um, you know, if this is your first time joining, welcome to the Impassive Investing Made Simple Masterclass. This is a webinar series where we help you learn kind of the ins and outs of passive investing, taking all this knowledge, all these things that you can read about reading blogs, you know, hear about at conferences and actually put it into action, put you in touch with the experts and the people who are actually doing the investing. So um, if you love this sort of content, make sure to go to PassiveInvestingWithWhitney.com, fill out the little form there. I've got some neat free tools there for you if you're um, just now making the four-way into passive investing. Also, if you'd like to hop on the phone with me, you can also schedule a time to do that there. And if you'd like to see the deal flow with PassiveInvesting.com, guess what? You can do it all in one stop at PassiveInvestingWithWhitney.com. But I'm going to kick off today's um, episode. We have an amazing guest here, Brett Swartz with Capital Gains Tax Solution. Brett and I have shared the stage at an event before, and just I was so amazed, not only by his like presence and his personality, but also just like how how he can take this complex topic of capital gains, um, you know, deferred sales trust, how and how it can limit what you pay in capital gains. Maybe you have a business, maybe you have cryptocurrency, maybe you've got a high value real estate asset you need to reposition, but I, I'm not going to spoil it for you. Let's go ahead and start. Brett, just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into this space. Whitney, thanks so much for having me. It's an honor to be here and I uh, love PassingInvesting.com and everything that uh, you and Dan and so many others are building, Brandon and uh, uh, the, other, the other name right now. Oh, uh, but anyways. Um, yeah, I got started in real estate at a young age. I fell in love with cash flow real estate. I fell in love with development. I fell in love with brokerage. In fact, my mom and dad and my brother, we all built, uh, we, we were coming along for the ride, building houses in the Bay Area. Mission San Jose, Fremont, and this is in the 1980s, you know, hammer pants days. We'd be in the Bobcat, hammering nails, you know, seeing project go from nothing to all the way to development. And it's kind of uh, knew that I wanted to be in real estate long term at some point. Went away to college, played some college hoops on scholarship, which was really fun, but also knew I wanted something competitive. And so I took an internship at a place called Marcus and Millichap, where I started to learn the underwriting, the the fundamentals of cash flow, of of IRR, or of of cap rates, of negotiations, of inspections, of all things like multifamily investment real estate. And um, we learned about the 1031 exchange about day three and things were going pretty good for in 2006. In fact, the marketplace was red hot and we were seeing all time highs, very low inventory. Everyone loved being a seller, but they hated it. A lot of them, a lot of them didn't really appreciate being a 1031 buyer because they had this 45 day identification, 180 day close. But, you know, like a lot of us, we thought the market would just keep on rolling. Something happened in 2008, you might remember. And, you know, I went from making a little bit of money, just getting started, newly married, you know, baby on the way to like nothing overnight. I mean, it was not just me, but a lot of Marcus and Milchap agents were making big, big bucks to like zero when everything hit the fan in 08. 
And so I did what I think every entrepreneur or real estate wannabe does. You get a side hustle job and you talk, talk with perhaps your significant others, my wife at the time, to say, how do we keep the lights on? And that became a kind of the bottom flat of my back moment of financial and for the first time not have, feeling like I was succeeding, I was failing, right? And a lot of things that go into that, but I, uh, I got a job at a place called Cheesecake Factory. I got a, another job at working nights and weekends and I started to burn the candle at both ends of these basketball tournaments. But by day I'd make cold calls at Marcus and Millichap and I'd negotiate with banks and help people keep out the properties or help them uh, continue to increase their rents and different, different creative ways to, to keep renters in. And by night, I'd work at Cheesecake Factory. I did that for two years, and we also moved to my brother's small condo. I always say that because you're hearing this story, and you're seeing success on this side. But at one point, I knew nothing about the Deferred Sales Trust, nothing about capital, capital gains tax fraud, except a little bit about 1031 exchanges. And it was during this time period of this journey, my clients were going through a similar financial struggle. Now, they were multimillionaires, but they're figuring out a way how to keep those millions, right? How to not feel trapped by capital gains tax, how to, how to actually renegotiate with the banks. And what we identified is what had happened when we basically analyze what happened the previous few years is that the 1031 is not always your friend. In fact, a lot of people had overpaid in properties that they knew they were overpaying for, and to their detriment, they lost. And some of them lost half, some lost everything. And over the three-year period, I saw one particular client of mine lose $50 million worth of real estate. And it's well, just let's, going- let's pause right here. So yeah. sorry, before I, because you have some amazing stats, but we might have some people here that are um, not clear on what a 1031 is. So let's mm -hmm. let's kind of define that, because you're right, like the time, it's a net, it's a great tool when used effectively, but also it can be kind of cut against an investor. Let's let's dive into yeah, that. Yeah, so a 1031 exchange is just a way to defer capital gains tax. It's kind of like an IRA. It's kind of like a 401k in that instead of taking personal funds or the funds at closing, the gains of that, you can put it into this vehicle and as long as you follow the rules, a 1031 exchange accommodator is the first step and it's in a deferral state. And then if you move those funds into an investment property and you follow you know, this 45 day identification, 180 day close, essentially you're deferring tax. So let's say you bought a property for a million dollars, you sold it for three. Well, do you want to pay tax on the $2 million gain or do you want to roll all three into this next property? And again, this, this is one of the best things that the government has given us. We want to be thankful for what they've given us and they're keeping the 1031 around, but it's just a way to defer capital gains tax, but it only works for investment property. And so you have an amazing solution here in the deferred sales trust. And I know you're going to, you're about to dive into like, you know, how you were able to like, you know, craft the solution for these multimillionaires, but what, what is a deferred sales trust? Can you write so, that down? 60 second definition. Yeah. But, but real quick, I want to finish the story. Just so you know, the clients were going through all of those challenges, losing their wealth. And we identify as a 1031 wasn't their friend. So I started to learn about the deferred sales trust as a way to solve that. And like most people, we thought it was too good to be true, but I started to actually apply it and send referrals and meet with the tax attorneys and go through it all. And over these 10 years, I have the 10,000 hours in my head and now I'm just trying to educate people. But I was able to retire from the Cheesecake Factory. My wife and I have five kids. Uh, she never had to go back to, to work, which is a big value of ours. She really wanted to focus on our kids. We homeschool our kids. We live here in Sacramento, California. And now I just train and coach people how to do this and what's actually possible and how to never feel trapped by the 1031 exchange ever again, how to, how to, how to defer capital gains tax on cryptocurrency, businesses, real estate, and, and then, and then, just have freedom to invest when it makes sense for you. So yeah, so the deferred sales trust in 60 seconds, it's just an installment sale. And for those who don't know who an installment sale is, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way to defer capital gains tax by becoming a lender to a buyer. So let's just say Whitney had a property that she owned for a million dollars and she, she's owned it for 27 and a half years. She had no, no, no debt on it. It's fully depreciated. And Susie wants to buy it. Whitney could finance her. Whitney could become the bank. It's called seller financing, and she could carry back 100% financing. And in, in other words, she could incentivize the buyer to buy, but also she, get, she doesn't have to pay tax on what she hasn't received yet. She's in a deferral state, okay? And so the foundation of the deferred sales trust is just a trust coupled with an installment sale. And the neat part is, is Whitney doesn't have to finance Susie Whitney finances the trust. We ask Susie to come with all the cash and the smoke clears and Susie has the property. Whitney has a promissory note. She's become the lender. And this is where the fun starts. The funds can go into different investments, different things. And, but that's the essence of hopefully maybe that's 90 seconds. <laughs> so, um, so that do, 
let's break it down. Like what happens within that trust? So the money's never leave the trust, right? So if I get a seller, buyer, you know, they transact within the trust. Then like, okay, like if I'm the seller, then how does that benefit me? Yeah, so um, close, okay. So the 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 property is, oh, you know, let's say it's a million dollar deal, right? And, and, the, and the buyer has the full million dollars, right? And they're about to, you're about to just kick all the cash and pay the tax. The trust jumps in right in between and actually buys your position for 1 million and then asks you to carry back 100% financing. So you're exchanging your property for a promissory note. You're trading that. You're chaining your ownership hat to a lender hat. And, and you're asking the trust to pay you back the million plus 8%. And the buyer takes title and they're gone. So how it benefits you is you start to get interest off of this. It's owed to you. Just like how does it benefit a bank to do a loan for your primary house or a commercial property? Well, it benefits the bank because they're going to get, they loan you the money. They're going to get their money back plus a return, or they're going to foreclose and take the asset. Okay. Okay. So how is this a powerful wealth building strategy for investors to use? Yeah. So you got to compare this, um, first of all, you want to clarify what you're trying to accomplish. Okay. And so a uh, wealth building strategy can, is kind of a, uh, it can be kind of a broad subject. So depending on our clients, so we just, I'll give you, give you some deal stories. So this is what brings it to life. I have a very entrepreneurial real estate, uh, client of mine named Shay and Shay is with the Grace Ray group. He's out of Alabama and Tennessee, and he sold his business a couple of years ago for 2.6 million and he had no basis and he had a huge tax liability. And part of what was a great part of the deferred sales trust, not only deferring the tax, but it's what the funds can do with him to partner with him to build 70 multifamily units in Tennessee, all tax deferred. And so the question is, how do we use what the government has given us to build our wealth? Well, again, think about an IRA or a 401k or a 1031 exchange or a deferred sales trust. These are all ways to use what's owed to the government in a deferral and we spread out time and we can use the law of compounding interest to go build more wealth. So in his scenario, he's literally building with the trust and with up another partner, all these units that the money he would have paid to the government have been gone forever. So he's creating wealth. So that's the number one way to do it. Some clients want retirement. We just closed a deal last week for Chuck out of Arizona. He's been managing properties for 25 years. And he's like, I'm tired of, of multifamily. I'm tired of all the student housing, all the students calling me all the time. You know, part of him love what he did, but he's like, I'm ready to retire. And so he has his wealth. He also thinks it's all time high is to sell. So he's like, Brett, I want to sell. I want to diversify. I want to put it into liquid investments. For him, it happened to be the stock market. Stocks, bonds, mutual funds. He's like, just put in the best companies in the world. Like, I don't, I don't need any more millions. I just want consistent preservation of capital and consistent cash flow and none of the headaches. However, I might, you know, I might, I might want to buy a deal in a couple of years. And that's where the trust can can go back in at any time no timing restrictions on back into real estate, all tax deferred. And so the trust can actually invest. Yes. Awesome. Okay. That's where I was trying to, I was like, the, 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 the pieces weren't connecting for me. It was like, okay, so the money goes in the trust. I get to know, but like, what is it? What all this money sits in the trust? What, what, what seems like a waste. <laughs> oh yeah. It's stocks, bonds, mutual funds, hard money lending. It can be into passive or active real estate deals. It can go into a business venture. We just had another deal for a, a, a $50,000 Bitcoin seller or owner that went to 50 million and she exited 5 million. She's in her 20s. She's working for Google and she doesn't want to build Google's dream, right? Build their wealth. She wants to build her own wealth dream and she wants to do something she really loves. She's passionate about, which is an online educational platform with her college roommate. And so she used the trust to be a, the seed capital to fund the business and to 4 million of the five day one. And so instead of going, we call it the go fund yourself. So instead of using other people's money or, 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 or the bank's money, the trust owes you the money, but you can partner with the trust to go do it. And so it's, it's a phenomenal way to build wealth and unlock freedom with your capital versus just being in the blockbuster 1031 shotgun wedding, which is very, very tough to do because it can't go into like kind deals. It can only go into like kind deals. It can't go into, um, you know, securities. It can't go into hard money lending. It can't go into uh, typically ground up development. Um, it can't go into business ventures. It only, it only works for that small investment, investment real estate owner. So what I really loved about this, because I spoke with one of your counterparts at the conference we were at this last weekend, and you, you know, the gains can go into the trust and then like, you can do it all. Like, 
you can go into business, you can go into, you know, real estate, you didn't have to like choose. And so that's, you could choose it all, the smorgasbord, so to speak. You can diversify. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So, okay. I can imagine, let, and I want to kind of put a, contain, a couple of containers around this. I imagine the DST is for somebody and not for other people. So who is it for and who is it not for? Great question, right? Who is the deferred sales trust not for? It's for anyone who has a deal that's too small, meaning they have the taxes are too small. So our minimum net proceeds and minimum, minimal gain is $1 million net proceeds, $1 million gain. Unless you have two assets at 500 each that you're selling in a short period of time that you could combine. And the reason is, is because you got to have enough tax liability to defer to actually hire us for our services. So we want to make sure those ratios are good. Uh, the second thing would be you actually found a 1031 deal. And by the way, you still can. Don't give up, right? There's still the needle in a haystack. There's still a value add deal that's waiting for you. If you can turn up enough rocks and have enough broker relationships, I'm a 1031 exchange multifamily broker here in Sacramento. Again, I, I love 1031s if the deal makes sense. So then go ahead and do that. You don't need us. In fact, that's um, that's that's a great option. Um, but for everybody else, honestly, unless you want to give it all the way to charity, you want to buy a bunch of life insurance, you want to do a bunch of gifting, um, the deferred sales trust to us is the most flexible, uh, proven legally, um, tax deferral solution. And this is why we're so passionate about it, trying to get the message out. Awesome. So I have a question. Um, like what if somebody is going through a 1031 exchange and they're getting down to like day 40, 41, 42, like, can you set up a DST like in the middle of this? The answer is yes. The deferred sales trust can save a failed 1031 exchange, even past the 45 day identification or even before, as long as you're working with an accommodator that will actually accommodate. Here's the big secret, Whitney. Guess what? There's a lot of accommodators that don't want you to know about this. There's a lot of brokers that don't want you to know about this. And I'm a broker, right? And I love brokers and I love accommodators, right? But I'm in the inside circle. I've sold over a hundred million dollars in commercial real estate. Like I, but I just go, wow, like there's a whole industry. There's 5,000 QI companies banging the drum of 1031 is like, this is the only way, or this is the best way. And you're like, well, it is one way, but there's also a deferred sales trust, but there's only one law firm business partners that are doing this. And so there's, there's a, cause it's kind of a, let's say a little bit of a battle, which we, we encourage the battle. And by the way, we want to give them all the options, but, um, yeah, you can save it, but you want to make sure you get with accommodator. And by the way, we have those that uh, give you both options. They're not going to be so biased just to their one thing. Or the other thing is they don't understand it, right? Like they're just, they're, it's like the Wells Fargo bank. Are they going to do some creative commercial real estate lending deal? No, because they don't understand it. They don't want it. They're just so big doing all of their stuff and you can't blame them. They don't want to step outside of their circle of, of, of focus and of expertise. And that's where we come in to help people have an alternative. Oh, awesome. Awesome. So I would love, I mean, you've, you've kind of like painted a picture of people that um, have qualified to set up the deferred sales trust, right? The reasons why they set it up going, going into it. But can you paint for us a picture of like an example of people that have had actually funded the trust and what kind of their, their journey looks like, you know, over time there? Yeah, we'll give, a, I'll give a couple of deal stories. That's always, always the best thing. Um, so I already told you about Chuck, I already told you about Shay. Let's tell you about Dave. So Dave was selling a $7.6 million property um, in Athens, Georgia, and he was actually past his 45 identification. This is during uh, COVID, like, 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 you know, spring of 2020. And he's all of a sudden finding himself like, oh my gosh, I'm not sure A, that I can even find a deal, but B, there's a lot of uncertainty. But the biggest thing for him was he had 4.6 million of debt replacement, right? He had about 3 million of equity, and he's looking around going, do I want to risk buying something? I have to buy something for 7.6 or greater, take on all this debt right now. Also, he's close to, you know, he's in his late 60s. He's like, I actually have a heart for serving the corporate leadership world in a, in a place in Montana. If you've seen uh, the show Yellowstone, right? But he has like a ranch out there that it's like a corporate retreat that he brings in leaders and he wants to develop them and help them to think beyond, um, increase their leadership and think about, um, really just being better people. Right. And so it's a cool thing that he wants to do. He doesn't want to focus on chasing another, you know, hundred units. Like he's like, I've done 30, you know, hundreds of deals, hundreds of 1031 exchanges. Like I don't need the millions. I don't want to also pay a mil point one million of tax. His liability was 1.1. So he found himself in between a rock and a hard place. Um, and he goes, let's just 
get it liquid, get it diversified. Let's invest it with some passive real estate investment groups that he knew, he knew, like, and trust. And that's what we did. So for him, um, that was the solution and it's worked out great. In fact, you can see his whole episode on my, on my podcast. You can, you can watch him on my YouTube channel. He tells his whole story. So that's one of them. If you want to hear some more, I'm happy to share them. We've got some questions coming in. Um, one question is, um, how risky is the product? What's, what are the risks here? Yeah, the, most people, when they think about risk, I think they're referring to the legal risk is the first one. And then we'll talk about financial risk, okay? So most people are like, Brett, this sounds like it's too good to be true. It seems like my CPA would know about it. Like, I just don't understand how I haven't been told about this. Like, I have some of the best CPAs and people that I work with, and we have this every single day where people are just blown away that their CPA they got it confused with a Delaware statutory trust, which is the most common thing. They go, oh yeah, yeah, we know a DST. No, 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 it's not a Delaware statutory trust. A Delaware statutory trust is just another form of a 1031 exchange. Okay, we call it the Hollywood video to the Blockbuster 1031. It's just a, just part of that family. And they just have their place, by the way. Or they've heard of a deferred sales trust, but they've never actually done it. And so they're very cautious, as they should be with something they've never heard of or never done, to recommend it to someone they've, they have never met. And however, this is part of why we have a no cost, no obligation due diligence and where they can get with us and they can sit down with us and um, review what this is, answer questions to get comfortable. Um, but more than that, you want to ask a few questions for anyone who thinks there's legal risk. Here's the number one question. How many of these have been done? The Deferred Sales Trust, thousands of closes. Number two, how long have they been, been going on for? The answer is over 25 years. Number three, of those, how many of those have been audited? About over a dozen so far. Okay. Of the audited ones, what was the outcome? The outcome was no change, no findings. So perfect, perfect outcome, which is actually really remarkable. If Whitney and I were getting an audit on our personal business tax returns, there's going to be something they find. They found nothing in these. That's how it's batting a thousand. Now, has there been any formal audits? Yes. Has there been a promoter audits? Yes. Any findings? No findings. It's been perfect. Okay. Uh, what about private letter rulings? Yes, there is a private letter ruling, and in form and substance, it's been it's been it was it passed just fine. So it's literally batting a thousand. Plus, there's lifetime audit defense. So if you did get audited by the state or federal, the deferred sales trust tax attorneys provide that lifetime audit defense. But more than that, they're the actual ones who have defended the actual clients in the audit defense in the past. So you don't want to take a chance with either copycats or alternatives that don't have that track record and don't have that lifetime audit defense where no additional charge would be cost you. So uh, honestly, to me, that's why we are so passionate about this. And I have groups that approach me with other things that they want me to sell. And I just ask those series of questions. And honestly, within two or three of those questions, they just fall apart. And I'm just like, I'm not willing to put risk on my name on that. I'm not willing to take a chance with people that I'm telling this about. I want one that has this very, very, very long track record. So that's the legal risk. Any question on that one, Winnie? No, no, I think we're good on the legal risk part. So it could have been financial risk. We'll cover that real fast too. Well, there's always financial risk, depending on how and where the funds are invested. There's risk, right? This isn't a guaranteed return, although you can put it in some very safe instruments. But the beauty of the Deferred Sales Trust is you can put it in liquid investment grade securities is one option. Now, I'm biased to real estate with you. I know you guys are too. That's where it can also be diversified with multiple commercial real estate deals, passive or active, okay? And we got to keep some liquidity in the trust, right? So we want to keep some diversification, but it's all going to be depending on the client. The client's going to fill out a risk tolerance questionnaire and we mathematically score this and we work with professional financial advisors, securities advisors to part of this team. My role as a third party unrelated trustee, happen to be a commercial real estate expert, but we help to navigate these, this trust and you're like the CEO where nothing was without your approval. So a lot of times we say to people, well, where would you put the money anyways? And they say, well, I would have just put it into this investment. Okay, well, why don't instead of, you know, if say you sold it at 5 million and you paid about 2 million of tax and you had 3 million to put in that investment, why don't we put 5 million into that investment? And they're like, oh, you can do that? Yeah. So in other words, we're lowering your risk because we're giving you more money to work with. Now that 2 million is still owed to the government. It's just not owed right away. And it's at a 0% interest rate. This is a cool thing, Whitney, right? They say, Whitney, you owe us that too, but we'll charge you 0% as long as you keep it invested in businesses or real estate, uh, you know, investment real estate or securities. That's fine. Now, if you start receiving payments, that's when you pay some tax slowly. And that's, that's great. So they win, we win, the broker wins. That's why the IRS, um, and this is why the laws are in place to incentivize us 
to do certain actions to stimulate macroeconomics and the movement of funds. Otherwise, if they didn't give us the 1031 exchange or IRAs or 401ks or the deferred sales trust, we probably wouldn't sell or anything, right? Or move as much. They would be incentivized to do these deals or cost segregation for offsetting, you know, um, um, cash flow and depreciation on on deals, right? So that's that's kind of the answer. Hopefully, that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. So that brings up a question for me: like, how does like how does it unwind? Right. Is it a, a, do I have to die? And then it steps up and goes to my ears. Like what happens here? Yeah. What happens if I die with the deferred sales trust? The answer is it can pass to your kids or your heirs or someone else that you identify inside of your living trust and they can step into your shoes. So on one of our structures, you do forego what's called the stepped up basis, which is an amazing thing. And hopefully it stays around for a very long time. Um, which upon death, the basis steps up and your heirs can walk away. Whoever inherits it, capital gains tax-free. In this scenario, your heirs can step into your shoes and keep it, the tax deferral going. But if they exit it, they get taxed, right? And so you kind of got to kind of weigh those options on that. However, I will mention that estate tax is the big elephant in the room. And in fact, Dan Hanford, we just did a breakout session at the Best Ever Conference, and we were talking about this exact subject. For a lot of ultra high net worth clients, it's no longer about the, the capital gains tax. That's the tiger by the tail. You got to get that one under control. But the big elephant in the room, Whitney, is a state tax. It has nothing to do with a stepped up basis. And in fact, it's 40% of anything above your exclusion amounts, which is 22 million about married, 12 million single. And that's like, they, they go, hey, you got a step up basis, you're high fiving, but all of a sudden they go, hey, yo, it's 40%. So like I say, you're worth 100 million bucks. They're going to take a huge chunk of that 100 million, regardless of the capital gains tax stepped up basis, if that makes sense. Okay, awesome. So we solved that, by the way. So the answer is use it to the deferred sales trust. So that's part of why we're Netflix and not Blockbuster. As you exit, like if you could choose a 1031 versus the deferred sales trust, you would choose the deferred sales trust because we can move it outside of your taxable estate. Okay, which is like, Wow, like it's incredible, right? That's the key thing. Without buying insurance, without giving away to charity, without having to do any, any, uh, any gifting to kids. Okay, awesome. Okay, so, you know, I'm somebody new, still kind of like barely hanging on to like some of these details. Can you walk me through like how the de deferred sales trust is managed, like the managed kind of end to end management process, and then also, yeah. like, is there ever a case in point that I would want to dissolve the trust? Cool. Is it okay if I share my screen? Cause I'm going to, I'm going to do a little, a little graph. Is that okay? Yeah. Oh, let me, let me get, let me give you the power. You got the power. Do I think it. I got the power. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure it was cool to do that. So I'm going to just maximize this. I'm just going to scroll. I got a lot of slides here, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to scroll down to how this thing works. So you can kind of get a feel for that. Or is that slide? Um, and I think it's right on a different, different one. So, uh, sorry, I got to pull my other one. Uh, ask that question again as I'm pulling this up, um, Whitney. Well, I'm going to kind of throw some questions together. Let's start at the beginning, right? Like, mm -hmm. what is the setup time cost? What is the ongoing management? Mm -hmm. And then is there ever a point in time that I would want to dissolve this? Or is it just, is the trust just going in, in perpetuity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the timing of everything has to do with the timing of your sale. So we need to... We do need to set this thing up prior to the the uh, the uh, close of escrow, okay? And um, and I'll kind of map this out here. Um, let's go with slideshow. There's so it's nice and big. All right. And so Whitney, let's just say, actually, let me give a, let me give you a, 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 an actual deal that we did for a client. He bought Ethereum for a hundred thousand dollars. He and his wife. They live near San Francisco. He was in the tech in, tech 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 industry. This is my K, it's not very good there. But it went up to 13 million, Whitney, 13 million. Okay, and they're in their mid 40s and they're like, oh my goodness. But now it, it had gone from like 100,000 to like, you know, 2 million and then it dropped and it went to 6 million and it dropped and it went to nine and it dropped back to four. And then anyways, it just was just wild swing, right? But the one of the biggest things they wanted to, they wanted to get out and they didn't wanna pay a huge amount of tax, right? And so in California, at a $13 million gain, it's about, um, you know, 30, 37%. It's about, you know, $4.8 million, okay? If they were to exit all of it, right? So so this is what we're trying to solve for. Uh, but more than that, their vision was never working again, right? Having the passive 
passive cash flow to retire, spending time with their kids. He, he's, he's, he's dual citizen. He wanted to travel overseas more. He, he didn't want to be working 50, 60 hour corporate tech job anymore. He's been doing that for 20 years. And so, but the question is, how is, how are we going to get out without getting hammered by this tax? And so I sit down with them and I say, Hey, let me walk you through this. Okay. We're going to set up you have this $13 million here, right? And if, and if, if this, if this, you know, we got Kraken or a cash buyer were to come and pay you that 13 million, you know, Whitney, what happens if they were to take 13 million directly, right? That would be taxable, right? And they'd owe this 4.8. So we don't want to, we don't want them to hit that directly, right? We're going to set up this trust prior to close. And this trust is actually going to purchase their position for 13 million. Okay. And it's going to immediately sell it for 13 million. And that way, the cash that came from a Kraken account goes into the trust at 13 million. And so check this out, Wendy. If the trust bought and sold for the same price, how much gain does the trust have if it bought and sold for the same price? Zero. Zero, right? <laughs> and now if they did a 100% seller carry back, right? So they carried back all of the financing and they get a secured promissory note of 13 million at 8%. So they haven't received any cash. At, that's my at sign. It's kind of bad. At eight percent, right? They haven't received any of it. Um, they got a zero down payment. They're in a deferral state. So how much? If they haven't received any cash on zero, how much tax is triggered on zero? Zero. Right. So it's an extra four point eight here, right? And so the smoke clears, and lots of little steps in between there, right? Um, but now this is where the things open up. There's an allocation that's based upon their risk tolerance that's filled out. And they might say, hey, I want 25% in the S&P 500. I just want the biggest companies in the world, Costco, Google, Netflix. Just give me the top 25%, okay? I want to do 25% into some passive real estate, some passive stuff, right? It might be, they may go to passiveinvesting.com and check that out, all right? Passive. They might say, I want to do 25% on my own, active, okay? Active. And they might say, I want to keep 25% in cash for right now. Just just keep some reserves or I don't know, or you go into another business venture. It could be a mix, right? But the point is they've diversified this 13 million. Now this actual client of mine, we've just done seven and a half million so far. We did 5 million when Ethereum hit 3,000 a coin. And then we did another two and a half million when Ethereum hit about, I think it was like, I think it was around 4,000 a coin, right? And this is in the last 180 days. And anyways, so they've exited 7.5 and they still have they still have that other amount growing. So their actual promise, you know, is just for 7.5. So in other words, you don't have to do it all at once. You can, you can dollar cost average out, but you can also dollar cost average in. So you might you might say, hey, you know what, Brett? I want to I want to unlock optimal timing. What's optimal timing? Well, it probably doesn't mean investing in the stock market when Russia is invading Ukraine, right? It probably doesn't mean overpaying for a property in real estate that doesn't make any sense, right? But it may mean when you find a deal or Whitney finds you a deal that you can make some sense of to maybe put 25% into it. And then you might find another deal, maybe in a different geographical location, maybe a self storage facility, maybe multifamily, maybe a mix. You might put another 25% over there. And then you might find your own deal that you want to do, right? So the point is you're diversifying and you're putting it in, we call it the blue ocean, where it's the calm seas when it makes sense for you. You're not running around with a 45 day 180 shotgun wedding, not diversified, not liquid. But remember, crypto doesn't work for a 1031. A 1031 only works for investment real estate. But the deferred sales trust works for crypto, works for public private stock, works for business sales. We just did a uh, dentist who, who worked for 30 years in New Jersey. And he was wanting to retire from his, his business. He's going to retire. He's selling his practice for about 1.5 million. He has about $600,000 of liability. That's like 40%, right? And he's like, Brad, are you telling me that if I sell and don't use you, I have $600,000 less for retirement? Yeah. But if I sell and pay a little bit of fees, I have $600,000 more? Yeah. Sign me up. And we just closed it, right? And, and he's he's doing it. So hopefully that answers the questions, Whitney, or any, any, anything else I left out. Well, I think, you know, what we'll do is the people that are interested, we'll have you like, you know, you know, just, you know, tell them how they can get in touch with you because I think everybody's like situation timing is going to be different, cost is going to be different. But there was a question that came through here that I thought was pretty unique. I think you just answered that, but it was like the question is my wife and I already have a revocable trust. Our home at the lake is already in that trust. We are considering selling this home. 
how do we 1031 it into our trust when it is already there? Or do we have to set up another DST? Yeah, great question. So just to clarify, what you're referring to is likely a living trust, which by the way, there's thousands of different types of trust that have different, different capabilities, different things. What you're referring to is probably a living trust, which is primary focus is to pass on what you own, not going through probate, but going to those you wish. That includes your kids, that in, who's gonna take care of them if you pass, it includes your assets, who's gonna inherit them. So you're always gonna have a living trust, that's like step one. Now the deferred sales trust is a particular business trust that's gonna do business with you on the exit of highly appreciated assets. However, what you will receive is a promissory note, and this promissory note will be put inside of your living trust. So imagine this big box, it's a big living trust. The deferred sales trust is outside, and it's giving you this promissory note, and this promissory note is gonna go inside of your big living trust, and then as you pass, it passes to your kids, just like any other asset, okay? So you've traded your house for a promissory note. You become the lender, and you own the promissory note, that's the asset inside of the living trust. Okay, so the answer is yes, you do need to set up a deferred sales trust if you want to defer capital gains tax. Your living trust has nothing to do with deferring capital gains tax. Okay, awesome. And can you run over those, like the uh, million uh, net gain, million capital gain, is that what it was? Yes, yep. So our minimum is $1 million net proceeds and $1 million gain per transaction, unless you have two qualifying transactions that can combine to equal those amounts, okay? So you could have a cryptocurrency. By the way, the one little caveat to that, you might, I have a client right now, she has 40 different coins, and she's going to, we have a way to structure that into an LLC, and then exit the LLC, all in one, like one transaction, essentially, right? Um, or one day to do all those. So that's a little different. You could have a lot of coins if you want to exit, and that could qualify for 500. And then you could have like a $500,000 business or real estate transaction that you're selling. And combining those, it could be the 1 million, okay? So our average deal is about 2.6 to 2.9 million. And we're deferring somewhere around five to $600,000 of tax liability, right? And that's where we found the magic uh, spot, if you will, that everyone's feeling great because our fees, and I'll tell you our fees real fast, our fees are about 1.5% one time to set it up and about about 1.5 to 2% on an ongoing basis, no matter how and where the funds are invested. And so what we have done after, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of analyzing all of these deals, we're looking at what's the what's the ROI, right? Like if you had a $100 million deal, Whitney, and you're only deferring a million of tax, I'd be like, yeah, the ratios are off, Whitney. Just, just take your 99 million and be away. But if you have 100 million, you're gonna pay 300 to 400 uh, or 30 to 40 million in tax. I'd be like, man, this is a great deal. So we got to look at the ratios. By the way, we do this all no cost, no obligation. Like we'll help you map it all out. We'll do an x-ray of your deal. The key is be with us early so that you can, you can lay out your options and figure out if it's a good fit. Yeah. And I think that, you know, maybe not everybody can resonate with having a hundred billion dollar business that they're exiting right now, but you know, real estate prices have appreciated so greatly. I mean, I know I have you know, personal coaching clients that, you know, have houses like along the Western seaboard and, you know, they've got four or $5 million gain that they're looking at. I mean, you know, that, you know, you don't want to lose you know, 40% of that gain. So, yes. And so by the way, it works for primary homes. We just did a, a primary home of $8.3 million deal in Palo Alto and he could not exit Remember, primary homes do not work for 1031. We did another $7.9 million deal in Santa Cruz, um, and then we, you know, I did a $1.2 million multifamily sale in Colorado. Um, and so, so yeah, that the key is, you know, and by the way, you might be in New York or California, it's a higher tax state. Is there a way to potentially go a little bit lower than those minimums? Yeah, because your taxes are higher, but generally speaking for all 50 states, if it's 1 million net proceeds, $1 million gain, it's an absolute home run. Anything below that because on a scale of one to 10 goes to a nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And it's just, it, it, we just gotta be aware of what it is. But for some people they're like, Brett, that extra 300,000 means the world to me. Okay, there, there's a way to you know work with that. But we're, we gotta be, we gotta be, we're always, we're always cautious of going too low because then the fees eat it up and it's just, it's not a great fit for anybody. I had one other question. So this, is a, I, this was burning, uh, you know, a burning question for me, you know, cause we're in a similar position, you know, if we're gonna sell our primary house, you can stack this, can or can you stack this on top of the, the 121 exclusion? Yeah, good question. So um, can you stack it on top? So let's define what you can actually do. And I'll use the actual deal in Palo Alto for 8.3 million. It was his, it was his primary. He, he had a $6 million basis. He was single. 
Um, so he had a 250, uh, what's called 121 exclusion. So the w best way to think about it, Whitney, is just you add 250 to to your basis, your adjusted basis, right? And that becomes actually becomes your adjusted basis. You add 250 to your basis and any other improvements, right? So he had bought it for X, he had improved it for Y, and then you add 250. So his adjusted basis was like 6 million 250. He's selling for 8.3 million, okay? So now he also owed about 6 million. So he's in a tough spot here, right? So when he sold, he had about $800,000 of liability that we deferred with California. It's how high it is, right? So, so he doesn't lose that 121 exclusion. However, he cannot, without taking the cash from the trust and paying tax, he can't just have his cake and eat it too. In other words, you can't just take 250 or 500 like right now and be like, oh, I mean, I'm tax free with that and then put the rest in there. So you got to put it all into the trust if you want a hundred percent tax deferral. Now you're welcome to take whatever you want at closing, but you're going to pay tax on that in proportion to your gain versus your basis. So he would take a little bit of that 250 as he receives back. Does that make sense, Whitney? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you can't, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Got it. Okay. Yeah. You just, you can't, you're just going to do it later on. It's not like up front. You're, that's the most common thing. Like, well, I can just take my 500 up front and then no, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna happen slowly as you get out, right? You're gonna get a little bit of tax relief because you have that 121. Okay, awesome, awesome. So we are coming close to time, guys. I know there's a lot of questions still coming in. We will try to get to as many as we possibly can. But Brett, for those people who've got to leave here in a couple of minutes, what is the one thing that you want people to take away? Our investors to take away? Yeah, that there's a better way. It's. Uh, and it's something that is it can provide you with the freedom, the flexibility to retire, to invest in a new business venture, to separate a partnership, to eliminate estate tax. So it's it's about what you're trying to accomplish. So you've got to, you know, what I like to say around here is it's no longer about cash flow. It's about tax flow. And with $30 trillion of debt that the government is trying to figure out a way to manage, they're increasing taxes. And so it's more important than ever to work with those that can help you with your tax flow and not just your cash flow. Now it's always about cash flow. I don't want to say that you don't worry about your cash flow. That's number one. Okay. It always is. But increasingly now it's about your tax flow because it's not what you make, it's what you keep. And that's where you want to be able to take advantage of the deferred sales trust. By the way, we didn't even mention it can get you a new depreciation schedule. Right, let me give you this scenario. My client exited the $5 million of Bitcoin, okay? And she put it into a business, but she could also put it into real estate. And that real estate, she could put, let's say, a $5 million down payment on a deal. And she could get like a $15 million asset, multifamily asset. She could depreciate that asset on a cost seg study and accelerate. And she can get a lot of this cash flow tax-free, right? Like there's so many cool things that this thing unlocks from assets that are not depreciable, like public or private stock. Um, like cryptocurrency that you can put into assets that give you cash flow and depreciation. So that's, so that's the number one thing I would say to walk away with. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, how, Brett. How can people connect with you? Yes, they go to, yes, a couple ways. So we have some cool free ways and then we have some, um, not really many paid ways actually, but uh, except for my book that's coming out in about 30 days, you can check out Building a Tax Deferred Exit Strategy. And it's the proven playbook for unlocking your ideal wealth plan when selling assets of any kind for yourself or your clients. And we have some really cool people in here like Kevin Harrington from Shark Tank. And he he has, I had him on my show and we did an interview and he, he agreed to be a part of the book um, as well as giving you practical application of what, what the deferred sales trust can do for you. You can also go to capitalgainstaxsolutions.com uh, where you can see the book and you can register for our free mastermind because it's one thing to hear all this and it's like, oh my gosh, your mind explodes, but you want to get engaged with the community or you can walk side by side with those that are closing deals, that have closed deals, that are their CPAs, the skeptics, you know, that are you know, poking holes as much as they can in this, but we're all together in this because we're like Roman legions, Whitney, like you have your shield and I have my little spear and the key is to do this together and line up together and figure out all of our expertise and go ahead and keep the, uh, keep the tax man away as much as we can. Awesome. Well, Brett, thank you so much for your time today, guys. Um, if you're interested in getting more content just like this um, or hopping on PassiveInvesting.com's list to see our deal flow, be sure to check out PassiveInvestingWithWhitney.com. And again, thank you so much for taking your time out today to invest in yourself and spending it here with us. Bye, everybody.